Hey everybody, welcome back to the Nerdy Photographer Podcast. I'm your host, Casey Fatchett. Today I'm dusting off some old loot we had in the ship's storage bay. Lots of dust down here. And lots of interesting items too. Oh look, a flashlight. I need one of those. Let's just dust it off. Who dares awaken Chasm the Mighty? Wait, are you a genie? A gin, yes. Can we get to the wishes part? I was watching my stories. In a flashlight? It's a pocket dimension and a lamp, of sorts. I don't see why this is such a big leap. Fair enough. Hold on, I need to do the episode introduction. On this episode of the Nerdy Photographer Podcast, I'm talking to the king of headshots, the one and only Peter Hurley. Peter and I discuss what it takes to remain successful in the photography world while social media has us chasing algorithms, and he dishes out some great advice to all the photographers out there. Come on, come on, I'm not getting any younger. Aren't you, as an elemental being, ageless and eternal? I feel like this could be a long discussion, folks, so stay tuned for my interview with Peter Hurley right after the break. Hey there. Do you photograph people? Families? Couples? Weddings? Are you tired of using the same boring, static poses over and over again? Try the Nerdy Photographer's Let's Be Real Unposed Photography Prompts to get your subjects engaged with you and with each other. I developed these over 20 years and thousands of photo shoots. These prompts will help you capture dynamic, natural photos of your clients. And right now, you can save 25% on any of our prompt backs with the code POD25P. That's all uppercase, P-O-D-25-P. Stop posing and start prompting. Hello and welcome to the Nerdy Photographer Podcast. On this episode, I'm joined by, you may have seen him before, he's been featured on Good Morning America, Good Day New York, and in the New York Times. He's the king of headshots. Welcome, Peter Hurley. Casey, thanks for having me. This is awesome. I'm excited (laughs) to be here. We're going to start out with a little quick little icebreaker. We're going to roll the dice breaker. And it's a 16. And that means the question for you is, what is the best purchase or investment you have made in your photography business? Oh, that's a good one. Best purchase or investment would have to be, I mean, definitely when I first got my studio. <laughs> I mean, that was like such a huge deal. I think as a, as a, as people, you know, when you become, a lot of these people become photographers that just don't like ever think that they could do it without a studio. And they're like, how am I going to do this without a studio? Well, I was in my apartment for four years <laughs> and then finally I had an opportunity to get a studio. And I was like, all right, this is the moment. And I think a lot of photographers go through that and that's a huge moment for them. And I always stress that, you know, especially with headshots, you know, I did it out of my apartment in a studio apartments plop with my butt plopped on a windowsill. So for me to move into a studio was a huge, huge thing. Um, and, and it definitely, it definitely helped my career. And I think that that was the moment that I really felt like, Hey, this is, this is the, re-. I mean, it was already the real deal, but I was like, now <laughs> yeah. I feel like people be, when you have your own studio in New York city, people are like, like, I feel like that's a big deal. It is. It's huge. I mean, I remember like when I was like renting studios, um, and it just felt like it was such a process and you to tell people like, Oh, I'm not at the same place being able to have that place. That's yours that you can send people to. And it feels like you've reached another level of professionalism when you're there and you're like, yeah, it's my space. Like, even if you're sharing it with other people, like it's, it's my space and you can always come here and find me. Um, I bounced around for, <laughs> like over the years, uh, in New York, like bounced around to a couple of different locations, but like having a place for, like five years at a time with like, you know, people know where they can come to you and where your studio is. Yeah, that's great. I do. I just love it. I mean, the, the only issue I had is during the pandemic trying to figure out how to pay for it. Right. <laughs> you know, I was oh, like, yeah. almost oh, yeah. lost it, but I wasn't going to lose it. And my, my landlord's luckily a photographer and he, he understood. So he helped me out and, um, and I've got this amazing space. So I, 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 you know, even when I'm not shooting, I'm here working on stuff. It's just my creative space. It's two blocks from my apartment. So, uh, my That's first nice. studio was, was, was down the, down on, 26th street the other way now i'm on 26 between 6 and 7th but um so it's a little closer home but yeah it's 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 just great and i would not 
you know, I was, I was not prepared to let it go during, during the pandemic or anything. So. Okay. That, that, that leads me actually to my first question. Like, um, you've been very successful in the photography industry, uh, for the amount, like the entire time that you've been in it pretty much. How much of that success do you credit to focusing strictly on headshots? I would say um, my notoriety, my global, my like global, everything globally and everything that happened outside my studio uh, was because I was of headshots. I mean, I, but when I first started, I was a model and I started shooting my friends. And then it's funny because Casey and I are cut from the same cloth. We were both actors and then picked up camera. That's cool. So I was acting and then I, and then I just, one of the models was like, Hey, I need a headshot. Can you do it? And they pointed the camera at me. So my goal was I had been, um, I got, I had been shot by Bruce Weber a bunch. He encouraged me to pick up a camera and I was really looking at his, what he shot, like ad campaigns, fashion stuff, a lot of vanity fair stuff, being an actor, I really wanted to shoot, um, actors on set and do stuff for the, I didn't, I didn't think, I mean, I obviously thought headshots and wanted to make, make some money with headshots, but I was really, um, not focused on, I was focused on a, a, an entire photographic career and I got caught with what I call head getting, I got caught in headshot land. <laughs> I started making money you know, the Hobermans had hit a hundred thousand bucks first, probably yeah. when we were starting. And I was like, you know, I want to be a thousand dollar headshot photographer. And that's, that's where, and then the money started coming in. I was like, well, where, well, well how do I have time to concentrate on this commercial work and, get, and getting an agent? So I was kind of funneled into this, into this thing, which was fine because I was doing well, you know, but it wasn't until, um, the F stoppers walked in my door and said, Hey, we, we want to, we want to interview you and we want to do a, a feature on you on our site as the, as a headshot photographer. And I was like, okay. And that turn that was the, the real that was the turning bridge. point. Yeah. That's what got me the international attention. And, um, you know, we did a tutorial together and then, and then it just spiraled into a couple of YouTube videos that got me on, you know, good day, New York and good morning American stuff. And then, you know, Scott Kelby helped me write a book, you know, and, and gave me my first speaking gig at, at the Google plus, uh, conference. And I, you know, it's funny, I sucked at acting and it was probably a good thing that I quit, but I was, I, I think all the, all the classes that I took and everything got me more comfortable in front of people. So when I did the, when I started speaking and teaching and stuff like that, I was like, I used those acting chops and uh, that was huge. So I think the 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 headshots became my platform. It became what I'm most, most known for. But it was just by happenstance that I didn't go down another path and go down the, you know, I don't think I would have been that great of a fashion photographer with the with, with my eye. I don't know that my eye would go to that. My eye's drawn to the human face now. So it's all, it's all facially you know, facial stuff for me, yeah. but, um, who knows? I'm glad it worked out this way. I'm I mean, happy. There's something else that you like to do in your, I mean, when you're not taking pictures of like doing headshots is what, what do you like to do? Like, what, is there something oh my else God, you like actually, to take pictures of? I barely point the camera at anything else. The only other <laughs> thing that I really like that I got fortunate to do, um, being a, a Canon Explorer of light, like opens up a lot of doors for you. And I'm a big football fan. So I like the NFL. I've always been a giants fan, unfortunately. And uh, except for a couple years, a couple be, years, it can be worse. You could be like me and you could be a lions fan. Lions. Uh, oh, jeez. Yeah. It's been terrible. It's, you know, I grew up like I was like in, you know, I'm going to date myself, whatever, but like grew up with the Barry Sanders era lions where it was like yeah. almost good. And you're like, Oh <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. It could be and then Megatron, like which Megatron and Stafford couldn't do it either. Yeah, I know. I, it's, no. it's been a, a long and uh, arduous journey uh, as a lions fan. Very interesting. Anyway. So I, I um, there's an explorer of light. Um, Terrell Lloyd, who's the photographer for the 49ers and Canon was doing something with him. 
and I, they were playing the Giants. So I nudged my way in there and said, <laughs> hey, I'm a Giants fan. I don't shoot sports, but can I come? And they, and he was like, come on, come on. So I'm on the side of the field the first time, like a kid in a candy store. And they got footage of me on national television. Some guy did a, like, like blocked a, a pass or almost caught an interception. And he went running around and you see me laying down on the sidelines, like, <laughs> like laying down on the job. It's awesome. So I, and I just took those pictures for fun, but then it ended up escalating into, um, I met a, a very good friend of mine. Uh, her husband was the coach of the Raiders. So I got at the time, so I got to shoot the Raiders giants game. Of course I was like, I'm going to the Raiders giants game. So I shot that. And then I shot another Raiders game. I think, I think I shot the Raiders again. Maybe I shot them twice, maybe once. No, maybe it was just once. And then I got to shoot uh, for the Washington football team. So, and they used my images in their headquarters. And, you know, they said, come on, come shoot whenever you look, whenever you like. So, and, and that was, and I never, I did that just as that's like fun for me. Like it's yeah. a challenge. I just, re I have such respect for the, the sports photographers on the side. I was actually trying to stay out of what people like all the photographers would be like, what are you doing here? <laughs> like, be like, I was like, Oh, at least they know me. Okay, cool. So I ran into some friends and, and um, I tried to stay out of the way. And I realized, I think it goes to show that in this, in this thing that we do, the different genres, it's so specialized. Like, like I had a ad running on Facebook for, I do a workshop called the headshot intensive. I had an ad running and, um, and in the comments on Facebook, some guy wrote, learn headshots in two days. Is that a freaking joke? <laughs> and I was like, man, I'm still learning. And I've been at it 22 years now. And I'm telling you, it is so highly specialized. I'm so fine tuned in it now. And there's so much to learn and I'm still learning. So it's, uh, I mean, it's one of those things like for sports photography, especially football on the field, you got to keep your head on a swivel and know what's come like even because you're also i mean i've watched people do it like you're usually you have like a telephoto lens and you're like wait like your vision is like so like far ahead of you like you have to know that if somebody's coming on the field it's just it's one of those things where i'm like i don't know that i have i try to keep as a wedding photographer and other like when i'm doing events keep an eye on things everything that's going on around me um but that's really hard to do when you're staring down like a 400 millimeter or, you know, oh, your lens. It's crazy. <laughs> and you, and, and being a, being, being in the studio and on a tripod and everything and like not, and my subject not standing there and barely moving. And now there's like targets and stuff going all over the place. <laughs> Shooting a playoff game, the Washington, when the Washington football team played the Buccaneers last year and, and Antonio Brown comes running at me in the end zone and I got the 200, 400 on, with the converter, with the extender on it. And then, and he comes in and catches the ball and gets a touchdown. And I'm like on a monopod and I'm like all over the freaking place. I can't even freaking point it at him. And I shot like, I shot like a bunch of shots and I'm like, shit, he's too close. I can't <laughs> put the freaking frame. And I didn't realize that you could just undo the thing and, and, and flip the camera. Yeah. I was like, I couldn't, I was like, couldn't, didn't flip it vertically. I missed the chest pump with Tom Brady and I, but I got enough shots and I, and I pieced it. I composited all the ridiculous shots when I was out of control <laughs> together. And I posted on Instagram and he DM me, I sent it to him and, and he DM me. And he said, we got to get together. I want you to share. You're amazing. I love this shot. And I was like, oh my gosh, and AB's DMing me. That's so <laughs> fun. That's cool. I see a lot of those guys who carry like a, a second camera, like, like a, with a, like, especially down in the end zone, carry like a second body with them with like a 24 to 70, just in case like something's coming at them. Um, well, I had that, but it was all happening so fast. <laughs> I had two bodies and I had the 24 to 105. I think I might add the 24 to 70 on it. Or I had, I had a, uh, well, I know I no, I think I went with the, um, I think I had on my hip, the, the 28 to 70 uh, F2. That's what I, cause yeah, I did because that's what I shot. I shot a killer shot. So Washington football team was coming down and Taylor Heineke was, was um, running around in the backfield and he ran for the end zone and he dove and he was like super parallel to the, he was like, I got this shot of him 
just unbelievably diving into the end zone. And my shot is the one that they put in the Washington football team. Uh, they printed and put in their, in their headquarters. And it was better than the one that went, ran in the Washington post. And I was like, <laughs> shabang. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's, that's one of the things which, yeah, I, I would love to try at some point, but like, I don't know. I don't know. It's just, there's so much going on. Like you said, there's so much happening all at one. I, like, I wouldn't be like a sports illustrated photographer. Uh, those guys. And they're also like, they're jamming that stuff out like the same day. Like I, and I I've shot like, it's the same thing with like fashion week. Like I went to shoot like some fashion week stuff for some publications that I knew. And they was just like, they didn't need it like immediately, but those are like wire guys. They're sending that stuff out. Like, immediately afterwards like there's it's gone like it, it, like right afterwards i don't know if like if my <laughs> my workflow is that tight wow yeah 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 i know you're very good like even just in this conversation like i've watched your videos and stuff you're really good at engaging people and so much these days is about like social media engagement as we're moving more towards like reels and TikTok stuff, like Instagram is even like I've heard giving bonuses to accounts that can hit like a certain level of views on reels. The tide really seems to feel like it's turned against like the algorithm is turned against people who are like posting like still images. And I noticed, for example, like the, on your Instagram feed, the majority of your feed is not your work. It's not like still photos or anything like that. It's you like discussing things and talking about like what's going on. Like, how do you think that still photographers keep up and stay relevant in like this age of like where it's more and more video and like showing behind the scenes stuff going on? Yeah, I think everybody should be doing BTS stuff for themselves. I mean, for me, it's a little bit different because I'm uh, I don't know if I use the word. I don't know if it's influencer or more of a personality or, you know, I don't expect people to be jumping around and crazy like me and some of the posts that I do are kind of silly, but, um, <laughs> most of it's on brand for me because I'm a little crazy, but it's not geared so much toward my clientele, which I've always thought like how much, you know, I'm fortunate that I, that I built the brand and I bust my butt to get people in my door for headshots and they, and they walk in. So I don't really use, um, you know, social as, as I should, I don't believe for that. My social, since I have multiple sources of income, I'm doing different things. I'm like, right now I'm using the social a lot for an NFT project that I'm doing, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. And I'm also a coach. Um, I'm doing workshops. I'm coaching photographers. Most of my following is photographers and not my clientele. So keep myself relevant out there in the coaching. Cause I think it's very important. I've, I've got a, a really great um, group of photographers that are working with me now through the headshot crew. And, um, and so I, I call it going pro personal. So I kind of show my personal life professionally. I'm not, I'm not one of those people that care. Like people are like, well, you shouldn't show this, that, or the other. Actually, I, I got on a plane yesterday. I had a shoot down in Tampa and I got on a plane and the, the plane took off and then there was f a fire or something and all the, the mass came out of the ceiling. And then we had to turn around and la emergency land and all this stuff. And usually I would put that on my social, but I would, didn't, I was like, I don't know. And then, and then it was on the news and I was <laughs> like, damn, I should have like, I didn't even think about it. Like I usually do that kind of stuff. I'm always doing social. I actually took a video of the fire trucks like rushing over to the plane and stuff. And then I just deleted it. But I don't know why I'm telling you the story. I guess it was just kind of shocking for me, but I think I've changed like my, my, a little bit of men mentality on it. I think, um, I think part of it is that one, it's very difficult to grow a social following of people that are engaged and, and that want to, um, purchase what you're selling or market to. Right. So I have over a hundred thousand followers on, on Instagram and it's not growing like, and I'm posting and doing stuff. I could probably post my feed. I guess I would have to be a little bit more specific about uh, what I'm going for with that. So when I don't see the numbers growing and then I see the likes or whatever, many people follow me going down, like I have a bunch of followers that, that, that aren't engaged and I don't know how to get, 
the Instagram algorithm to fire those people up, <laughs> you know, it gets a little bit dissuading and dissuading. And I just settle down on it for a little while. And then I notice when I post again, it, it gets a little bit more engagement. So sometimes I'm, I'm laying low and sometimes I'm going for it. But I think as if you're a photographer out there listening to this, like Instagram's our platform. You should be posting a hell of a lot more of your work than I do. Um, I just do what I do because um, I'm, I'm, I'm basically doing stories and stuff and videos and stuff and using a lot of the video content. And I think all the still photographers should be paying attention to uh, creating content with video. And that's why I'm excited. Canon just announced the EOS R5C, which is super. I'm going to grab that puppy as soon as it comes out. I was going to get an R3, but I don't shoot sports enough to, to, you know, it doesn't make sense for me. So I was like, I'll get it maybe for more video capability and to shoot an NFL game here and there. But then I was like, wait a minute, the the R5C is out. This is gone. It's coming. I'm I'm jumping on that. Yeah. Well, I mean, and supposedly, I don't know. You'd probably know better than I would. There's maybe an R1 in the works somewhere. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see. I, mean, I, I have know. no, I have not, not heard a, a peep. And if I had, I would tell you, I wouldn't tell you because I couldn't because right. I, I yeah. I'm just saying that, but I haven't, there's, I there's have like the rumors always flying like, Oh, they're going to come out with something to challenge the, you know, whatever Sony a one or whatever. Um, but I'm a Canon guy also. So it's, Oh, you are. What do you shoot? I, I have not made the jump to mirrorless yet. I know you're shooting with the oh, R five. I, I, I've been like, there's this part of me that like, I've got a, you know, the 5d Mark four. I really love it. Uh, I got a 5d Mark four. I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm pondering the switch to the R five. It, it's like, I'm Dude, you're, you're, yeah. how old are you? I'm 46. Yeah. You're right at that age. It's <laughs> I'm telling you the auto eye detect when I was 45, I had to put on the glasses. My eye, <laughs> my eyesight oh, started going. The much- diopter is good, but I was like, the auto eye detect alone, <laughs> I was done. I'm like, oh man, I don't even have to look in the in the viewfinder if I don't want to anymore. It's unbelievable. The my, my eye doctor has said that my eyes are growing wiser. I mean, that was his way of there you uh, go. now you need uh, reading glasses. So I think this touches on like something that you were just saying. Like it it used to feel like to me, like with the photos, the the style of the photos was the brand. And I remember when you like, because I was involved in like the headshot, uh, community and the acting community, I remember when your like style, like the came out, like you, like the, the light, your lighting style is noticeable immediately at that point. That was like, that's a Peter Hurley headshot. Like you just knew that that's, yeah. that was, that was your style. And that became the like, kind of your brand. But now yeah. it feels like, uh, photographers themselves are becoming the brand even when it's like you know not just for like like yourself or influencers or you know whatever you want to like a, a person a photography personality i definitely would think is a way to describe you like you're not just about the picture but you're also like you said a canon explorer of light and you the headshot crew and all those things that are kind of outside of just taking pictures you're an ambassador of photography uh but i feel like you know do you feel like that is the, like where things have come, like you know, where the photographers you deal with a lot of, like you said, they are training a lot of people in headshots and things like that, but that now it's become more about the, your own personality is becoming the brand as opposed to the style. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I always thought that a, a good shooter is a good shooter, you know, regardless of personality, if you can take a picture, I mean, and it stands out from the crowd, then you got something. And I don't think that that ever is going to change. I mean, I just don't think somebody with less talent is going to be put ahead. If somebody with less talent with a big personality. Yes. They'll more doors may open, but somebody that's, that's, that's talented. There's just no way to stop them if they're that good. I mean, I just think it, I think it happens. I, one thing that um, I have guests on my, uh, I, I do uh you know, zooms every, every day of the week. And I have this one called crashing the crew on, on Thursdays, I bring in a speaker and, and somebody to somebody to give a little talk and Gregory Heisler came in and I, I know this quote is out there and I don't think it's from him, but he said it. And, and I always give credit where, where credit's due. I think somebody said this first, but, um, and I, and I've read it in books and stuff like that. 
But he said specifically for photographers and this, I believe that we have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And it's so true. You know, I think the camera gives a lot of people a lot of power. So introverts get, get their, their sense of power through the, through the, the camera, the camera's so ridiculously power. I've never had anybody look into it and not be, you know, kind of immersed in it. It's very, it's very daunting to be in front of a camera in the first place. And then, and then most people are affected by it and change. And our job as photographers is changing back, just getting yeah. to be cool and chill. But, and, and everybody does that with their own personality. So I think um, if you've gotten to the stage where you're building a business around this and you have to get your personality, your own way, done. Like it has to be you. Like, don't, I don't think anybody, I tell my students, like, don't try and be me. I'm a little nuts. Like, you know, <laughs> it's not gonna, it's not gonna, it's not gonna pan out for you unless you're a little nuts too. I'll give you all the, all the, all the, all the stuff I do this crazy, but, um, but that's not it at all. What it is, is that, is that we're dealing with human beings as portrait photographers. And, um, and I think the rapport between between our us and our subject is the thing. I mean, I, I, people, you know, when I shot the sports stuff happens in front of me and it's exciting and I'm trying to capture it best I can. And there's this talent there. You don't need personality for that. Right. And, and if you're doing that, well, you know, the pictures are going to speak to themselves. If you show it to an editor, you know, they're going to be like, this person's awesome, you know, and then you're going to get the job. But if you're, you know, shooting people and opening up a portrait studio and we have to have different hats. Like nobody told me that I had to, I had to be a businessman, oh, you know, yeah. as a that's <laughs> a different hat that you have to wear. That's a big deal. Um, so, but yeah, personality, I think a lot of people out there might use that as a crutch. Well, I'm, you know, I'm introverted. I'm not very outgoing at all. I'm quiet. I'm shy. I, no, you have a camera in front of you, you know, and if you enjoy shooting people, you'll figure it out in your own way. And you have to. So you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable and you have to go for it and do it. And that's it. Otherwise put the freaking thing down and go do something else. Yeah. And you have to be like comfortable. I think being yourself, who you, who you are, like what, I mean, there's a reason this podcast is called the nerdy photographer. It's like, it's not because, uh, you know, I'm super cool, dude. Uh, it's, you know, because I'm a bit of you're a not nerd. as nerdy. Like, I don't think you don't have glasses. <laughs> like you're not as nerdy as I thought you might be. I mean, come on. Like, it's, uh, you know, but it's just like the, the way that I geek out about yeah, like the voice, camera stuff. The voice is awesome. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's the way in which I think about photography is generally like, oh, I, I can geek out about like the specs on a camera or like, oh, let's like, I would like to build this thing that I need for a shoot as opposed to like go out and buy it or something like that. Like there's, that's why like, like embracing those things about myself that are like that sort of love for what I'm doing. And that I think comes across, especially in my wedding work. Like my, I tend to feel a little bit introverted at times. Like when a camera is pointed at me, which is weird because I was an actor. But the thing is when I was acting, there was a role to play. Well, that there was, you go. I know that. To actors. That's very much to like something to hide behind in some ways. And. Well, you're not static. I tell because agents will say to me, all right, I need our managers. They'll be, be like, I need this out of this person, this out of this person. I need this shot, this shot, this shot, this shot. Then the person comes in and they're flat as a board. Yeah. And I'm like, how do they, they have no clue what their talent is capable of doing in front of a still camera. Right. But when that person gets the script and gets the character and has to move and, and there's life put into it, it's a different ball game. When you stop everybody, cause you can't shoot them like that. It's never right. going to work. Right. You gotta have to like, like, when, it, when I was doing headshots, like I would always like tell people like as an actor and, you know, like think about like, let's put you in a role like that you want, like, unless I had like some sort of like, you're saying like, unless the management or whatever was saying like, we need this type of look from them. But it, for like independent people who had, did not have rep representation, I, I normally would like say like, okay, what kind of roles are you going for? And Sometimes I'd be like, mm, I think you might be going a little bit against type. If you're going like way against type, then we need to have a discussion. But like getting them into thinking about the role helped them focus on it. But with weddings, what I've found is that I've used my sort of uh, oh, what's it? self consciousness on camera, how I feel like I judge myself 
and I think about the angles and I think about if somebody's taking, I'm the worst wedding guest in the world because I am constantly analyzing what the photographer is doing. And, oh yeah. Oh yeah. And, and if they're taking a picture of me, I'm like, what lens are they using? What, what, what angle? Yeah. And I kind of like, you know, it automatically, it's like going and seeing somebody do your job it, like, as well, how I describe it. And I've photographed numerous friends of mine's weddings because I told them like, if I go to your wedding and I'm not the photographer, like we'll have somebody else come and do the reception. I'll dance and have a drink at the reception or whatever. I'll have somebody there for that. But like during the ceremony, I am judging hard on anybody. And like when the cameras turned at me, uh, I start feeling self-conscious, but I use that when I'm dealing with my clients and saying like, let how do I make you feel comfortable? How do I get you to a level where you don't think about me taking pictures? Because that's for me, it's very, very, it's different than headshots where people are looking right at the camera. I want to get like natural, authentic interactions. And, but it's all about making people like feel okay having their picture taken so that they're not like yeah. stiff and they're not, you know, like, uh, what, what's going on here? Um, yeah, I think that that's like, and as a photographer, you need to get comfortable with who you are, like you said, like to make that happen for your client. Um, yeah. And that actually answers two of my other questions that I had. Um, you have been, I, I was guessing like to stay at the kind of like the, the edge and trying to be on the, trying to be on the leading edge of, you know, being a, uh, photography personality and also maintaining a, uh, your headshot business and the headshot crew, um, you've been able to adapt and find other things to contribute to your photography business. What are some topics that you think are going to shape the photography world in the next year or even maybe like over the next five years? Well, I mean, the biggest one is NFTs. I mean, I think everybody's seeing that. And, and, and guys, I just said NFT. And if you haven't heard that yet, you're, you're probably you're living, living under, under a rock. rock if you haven't heard right. It. Yeah. Yeah. And then, but you might not know what it is, but you've heard it. And if you haven't heard it now, you've heard it. So um, I would suggest everybody look into it. I mean, I think that that uh, is a game changer for photographers in a way that, that we've never seen before. I mean, we all have, like you said, you shoot, you shot up a ton of film. Like I started out in film and, and was shooting film like crazy. And I, and I have all these archives of stuff that I has been sitting there and I wouldn't even know what to do with it. What, but what I could do is I could turn things into NFTs and I, and I have another source of income right there. Um, I, since I shoot individuals and I, and I'm mostly shooting headshots, I also do portraiture and stuff like that. Um, I don't know that I'm going to be selling like, like, I mean, maybe if I have some celebrities that I can say, Hey, can we sell this image? I took of you as an M NFT and get some permissions for that. Then maybe I would do it or, or I would do a shoot with NFTs in mind. I just right. did one where I knew that they were going to use it as an <laughs> NFT with that goal in mind. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And if people don't know what it is, like really get out there and educate yourself on what they are. Um, because it is like, a, it's a topic that there's a lot of scrutiny of things. There's a lot of like different, because there are some people who are not in the business who are not being on the level. Um, and like there's, there's a lot of scams out there. You got to watch out for That's for sure. For those of you that don't know, NFT stands for non-fungible token. And it is an ownership thing through the blockchain, through crypto, through crypto. So in the blockchain, um, you will have a record of a, of a sale and it follows that item. So let's say you take a picture and you find a platform to put that picture up on and, and one that photographer, many photographers are using, which has been kind of touted as the photographer platform for this is called foundation. And you put up a shot on foundation, people can go there and purchase that NFT. You give it a price, you do what's called minting it. You put it up there and you can, and, and people can go in and purchase that. Once somebody purchases that they own it, but if they sell it to somebody else, you can attach a royalty to it where you could still make 10% off of that, that future sale, which to me is added. Could you imagine like, like artists having this 
over the centuries, like, I don't, <laughs> like the, yeah. you know, whatever, or whatever, like now we have this new thing. It's crazy. So, um, that's why, you know, it, it opened my eyes and I, and I looked at it. now I haven't done, I haven't put any of my own work up there on foundation or open seas, the big platform that, that most people are using now. It's the most popular one. And, and I did put a collection uh, of N- NFTs up on open sea, which has been a blast, you know, and it's, and it's all eye opening to me. And I'm just trying to absorb as much information on it as possible. And uh, I think the timing right now is ridiculous. So if you're listening to this and you don't know any of this, go research Google, go on Twitter, see what people are saying. That's a big space for, for NFTs. I like to carry, I, I like to follow Gary V and, and Gary Vaynerchuk has a lot of information on this stuff that I'm absorbing. So I'm finding out more and more about it from guys like him and uh, another friend of mine, Tom Bilyeu, who uh, I bought a couple of his NFTs as well. So uh, it's been a really interesting space and and been fun to work in. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a huge, it's a huge industry right now. Um, the one thing that I would add is like for people to, like you said, be careful and make sure you're buying from someone <laughs> reputable if you're purchasing anything or just getting involved because I have seen like some people getting into like, I sat in on a couple of Twitter spaces about it and like some people seemed on the level and some people were like, seem more like a pyramid scheme where they're like, Hey, give us our, give us your money and we'll just make everybody else's, we'll make everybody in the group's NFTs go up in value by bidding on them. And I was like, guys, this sounds like, you know, like this could go wrong. Just so just be very careful about who you involve yourself with. Find someone reputable who's like, do your research. And well, first off, I mean, I think, I think you have to, we had a bunch of people that we put, I put shebangers is the name of my NFT project. So I yell shebang in a video that, that jawline video. And then anyway, we were trying to come up with a name and there's these really cool little camera guys, these guys, these figures with cameras on their heads. And we dropped, we dropped it in, uh, in October and, um, and we put it on open sea. And we own on open sea shebangers. So the, the, if you search shebangers, you're going to get ours, but there's also like four or five others in there that are fake. Yeah. And, and open is not monitoring the fake ones or, or closing them down. And I have had more and more people who have tried to go buy my shebanger, get screwed by somebody who's got a fake account and they lost their money in the blockchain. There's no turning back. Right. Like you can't Once get the money gone, back. It's gone. It's, it's gone. So you have to be very careful of what you're buying, how you're buying it. There's also, there's wallets out there that, that people will try and ask you for your passcode for your wallet, which is like a, like a series of like 12 words. Never give anybody that, <laughs> yeah. like that kind of stuff. And then it's we're like somebody calling of, you and saying like, Hey, by the way, what's your ATM pin? Um, <laughs> exactly. There you go. That's exactly what it is. So people are not educated and they're doing stuff like that. So, and a lot of the NFT uh, collections that are out there are, you know, a lot of hype and stuff like that. What I'm doing with mine is that I am corralling the photo industry and I've got a bunch of sponsors that are in with me right now, which we're going to do a big press release about and announce, announce them. But they're all the sponsors that I work with. Every sponsor that I work with have said, um, give me the thumbs up to my shebangers program, which is amazing. And we're creating a, a metaverse right now that we're going to, that I'm going to be teaching it. So I'm actually going to be teaching in my own metaverse <laughs> and we're creating a token called a Shabuck <laughs> that is going to be the payment form inside the metaverse. So my collection of shebangers, these little guys are going to actually be entry points and, and, uh, You'd be able to get you citizenship in what we're calling Shebangersville. So it's all very crazy to me. And if you had told me a year ago, I would be, these things would be coming out of my mouth. I would think that you would have to go away somewhere. <laughs> uh, but, but that's where we're at right now. And I can't tell you the excitement of brands and companies for this space. So if photographers are not on the lookout for this, and my job is to educate photographers getting into this into this space. Uh, that's part of what I want to do. Um, I, I want people to open up their eyes to this because it's too much of an opportunity for us to have another source of income. Um, other than like for years, the only source of income I had was putting somebody in front of my camera and pressing the button. Right. And now I have all these other outlets and, and I'm, and I'm, 
And I want photographers to be able to, um, you know, make a living besides just pressing the button and, and, and selling our work in this form, uh, is a huge bonus. So I think people have to be aware of it and you guys put it on your radar right now. Definitely. And I will include a link both in the episode notes and on the blog that takes you directly to Peter's, uh, shebangers so that you are not going to a fake shebangers, um, in case you want to check that out. Hey, I'm Dustin and I'm Steve and we host the wedding photo hangover podcast, a lighthearted look at the vast world of wedding photography. That's what we're doing. I thought we were making a podcast about drinking beers, flying drones. Did you even take yours out of the box? Coping yet? with your post wedding hangover, social media etiquette and wearing moon shoes. They're not moon shoes, Steve. They're just but seriously. Check us out. If you want to have a laugh and learn a thing or two about shooting weddings and running a wedding photography business, you can find the wedding photo hangover podcast on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts. Yeah, so I'm not sure how we handle the situation. Did you have a contract? Well, I had one I found for free online, but my lawyer says it might not hold up. Next time, you should head over to nerdyphotographer.com. They've got a selection of contract templates for weddings, events, portrait sessions, and even for hiring second photographers and associate photographers, which would certainly have helped you in your current situation. Really? I will check that out. Nerdyphotographer.com? Yep, nerdyphotographer.com. They've got all sorts of contracts and agreements that can help make sure to protect you and your clients. So what are you going to do? Well, we just have to wait and see what happens, I guess. So no pants on? Who know anything below the waist. Totally porky pig in it. Impressive. Not really. Yeah, it was pretty cold out. Yeah. Yep. Hey, hey, hey. And now for my favorite part of the show. What's that say? Useless information. Ugh. This is always dead. Peter, the average person spends 60 hours or two and a half days every year looking for lost items. Would you, would wow. you think that's accurate? Would you think you're yeah. right on average? Oh, I bet you it's more than that for me. <laughs> what do you think about like, I, I was like, yeah, uh, I, I might be like to make this an average. It's probably taking people like I'm probably over that, <coughs> especially just looking for my keys. I oh always, yeah. I always seem to like, I put my keys somewhere or in a jacket or on something. And I'm like, my wife is like, uh, why don't you just put them in that dish next to the door? And I'm like, yeah, cause I don't think that that's a great place to put them. And why would I do that? Cause then I won't have them in my pocket when I need to go somewhere. Yeah. I think that that's a low ball estimate for me. And you're saying it's low ball estimate for you. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> so my wife want every time I lose something, she wants to record me because I freak <laughs> out. I blame everybody for moving stuff. It's always somebody else's fault. And she's like, she's like, damn it. Why didn't I have the camera? And then I, I find it and then I calm down and it happens daily. <laughs> so I, I met this guy and he's the most organized man in America. He calls him, he calls himself. And, um, and he came into the studio. I was like, I got to shoot you. He goes, let's barter. I'll come to your house. You, I'll, you shoot me. And, um, and I was like, okay. So he comes to my house and, uh, and he goes through and he like, he really upset my wife because my wife's completely unorganized. And he was like, no, you got to do this, that, this is ridiculous. And he was very gung-ho and everything. And I was like, oh my gosh. But the thing that he taught me that, that was the most important thing that's changed my life in terms of organization, finding stuff is that everything should have a home. And cause if you, everything has a home, you have to put it in its home and it right. could have a home in your living room and a home in your bedroom, but you want it. No, you only go into one of those it's two only, places. Only one of those places. It doesn't go any place yeah. other than that. Yeah. That's so I started doing that and it's unbelievable how much time that saves. <laughs> I bet you, I might be under the 60 hours now. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, I don't know. I, I get, I, it escalates for me when I lose something or I can't find it. And it's usually my wife will watch like, well, 
she'll start asking the, the where did you have it last? Well, if any if anybody wants any help in that department, his name's Andrew Mellon. M E L L E N. And you can see you know, maybe he's got some tips or follows Instagram or something. He's Andrew underscore Mellon on, on Instagram, but, it, but it was helpful, you know, and it, it is interesting, but I think we all suffer from that. So that's, yeah. that's just the random it's, thing that we're in. Yeah, it's it's like, maybe it's the age we're at. I don't know. Um, yeah. Peter, thank you very much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. You're welcome back anytime. Um, just quickly before we head out, like where can people find you? Uh, and headshot crew, et cetera, et cetera, your projects. I mean, the best place, the best, yeah, my coaching platforms, headshot crew. So if you do photograph portraits and you don't have a headshot component in, in your work, you got to check this out. Um, it's, I just think it's essential to add headshots to your plate these days to what, what you're doing. So, uh, that's headshotcrew.com. All of this can be found on my Instagram link. My link in my bio is usually the best place. I mean, peterhurley.com is my photography. Instagram's Peter underscore Hurley. And that's really where everything stems from. So you could find me there. I answer every DM that comes my way. <laughs> Uh, that's the best way to contact me. I hate freaking emails. I don't even look at them. Clients are pissed at me. So, uh, <laughs> you know, definitely just Instagram, Peter underscore Hurley is probably the best. Awesome. Uh, and I will include all of those links, like I said, in the episode notes and on the blog, Peter, thanks for stopping by. Awesome. Casey. Thanks for having me. Welcome back, everyone. Many thanks to Peter Hurley for coming on the show. You can find links to Peter's website, the Headshot Crew, and his Shebangers project in the episode notes. As always, be sure to subscribe and leave a review for the Nerdy Photographer podcast on Apple Podcasts, or you can leave them on Podchaser or Good Pods, where you can actually leave reviews for individual episodes as well. Mm, how about that? Your reviews and recommendations really go a long way towards helping the podcast, since this is an independent podcast without a team of publicists or marketing people. The more you spread the word, the more often I can get guests like Peter Hurley to join us. You can also follow along on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at the nerdy photo. That's at the nerdy photo. I was looking at this flashlight. I think it has your name on it. K A Z apostrophe M. So is that apostrophe like a language thing or is it a contraction? Like is chasm short for Kazam? I'm not named after a Sinbad movie. No, that's a Shaquille O'Neal movie, and people think Sinbad did a genie movie called Shazam, but he didn't. You dare question my knowledge? Listen, there are things I know, and there are things I don't know. If you want to talk about movies with me, you better bring your A-game. Asim the Mighty just wants to get this over with so I can go back to my stories. Okay, okay. How about this? Can you make Sony shooters stop mentioning tones all the time? This is beyond my powers. Chasm, maybe you should head back to your pocket dimension. And I'll just hold on to these wishes until something more practical comes up. Until next time, everybody, stay safe and stay nerdy. Listen.